Since the dawn of the first industrial revolution, growth has been the motto of the global economy. Many economists believed that focusing on growth alone would lift people and societies out of poverty, and everyone would thrive as a result. Well, the global economy has grown spectacularly, but not everything turned out the way the economists predicted. For example, take income inequality. In 2021, the top 10% of the world took home 52% of total income, while the poorest half took home just 8%. The growth-focused economy has also led to major environmental problems. Today, climate-related catastrophes happen three times more often than in the 1970s and 1980s. This growth-focused economic model is relying on 19th and 20th century economic theories and assumptions. However, what we might need is a 21st century economic mindset to address our 21st century problems. In 2012, economist Kate Rayworth took a decisive step in that direction by introducing Donut Economics, a visual framework for sustainable development. We will first need to understand what the donut economics framework is. Shaped like a donut, the framework consists of two concentric circles. The inner circle is the social foundation, and the outer circle is the ecological ceiling. The social foundation takes inspiration from the social aspects of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. It represents a space where people have complete access to necessities, such as clean air, food, water and sanitation, housing and energy, education, social equity, and gender equality. When people don't have access to these essentials, they fall below the social foundation, into the donut hole. The ecological ceiling, on the other hand, refers to our planet's nine environmental boundaries, which were put forward by Earth system scientists Jonah Rockstrom and Will Steffen. Overshooting these environmental boundaries can destabilize the Earth, causing irreversible damage to people and the environment. To avoid such social and environmental destabilization, the Donut Economics Framework recommends that we should stay in the space between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling, where humanity has access to necessities without exceeding environmental limits. In the 21st century, many people still don't have a stable social foundation. For example, according to the 2020 Global Report on Food Crises, 130 million people suffer from acute hunger because of conflict, climate change, and economic crises. At the same time, we have already exceeded four of the nine planetary boundaries. Clearly, a growth-only focused economy backed up by 19th and 20th century economic theories and assumptions is not enough for letting everyone succeed. Let's examine these assumptions a bit closer. Adam Smith, the father of economics, introduced the self-interest assumption in his book, Wealth of Nations. He claimed that by producing and consuming goods to satisfy one's own self-interest, everyone's needs would be met. In short, keep selling, buying and consuming for your own self-interest, and everyone wins in the end. However, Adam Smith might not have considered the power of megacorporations' self-interest. Take oil companies, for example. Since the 1970s, oil companies have been informed of the negative impacts of fossil fuels on the environment. However, they decided to ignore the warnings in pursuit of self-interested profits. As a result, between 1970 and 2011, fossil fuels and industrial processes were responsible for increasing greenhouse gas emissions by 78%, leading directly to climate change-related disasters. Consumers, or other agents of the free market, can't really do much about it, considering the enormous amount of economic and political power these companies wield. So it's safe to say that when megacorporations like these oil companies act in their self-interest, only a select few win, while everyone else bears the cost. Another popular traditional economic assumption is that 
Man is rational. It assumes that people make decisions based on perfect information and careful calculation of cost and benefits. But does this reflect reality? Take gambling, for instance. Statistically, if you win or lose the first time, there is no reason to believe that you will win or lose the second time. However, research from psychology shows that when people have won a few rounds or lost a few rounds, they think they will either continue to win or that they will win soon. This irrational gambling behavior can lead to socioeconomic problems like financial losses and crime and health issues like depression and substance addiction. This kind of irrational decision-making, overestimating the benefits and not considering the costs or risks, happens not just in the casino, but in everyday economic activity. On a broader scale, 20th century economics assumes that economic activity only takes place between households and firms. Households provide labor to firms, and they receive wages in return. The wages are then used to buy goods and services from firms, creating a cycle known as the circular flows of income. But this circular flow of income does not paint the complete picture of the economy. Using this incomplete picture, economists have created the GDP metric. GDP tells us about aggregate consumption, but not the well-being of consumers. It recognizes household spending but not contributions made by a homemaker. It informs us about production, but not the pollution. It includes government expenditure and private investments, but not the outcomes generated from them. And it only acknowledges the value of trees when cut down and turned into benches, but not the value they provide when left standing. Now that we know the limitations of these 19th and 20th century assumptions, how does the donut economics framework help us overcome these shortcomings? First, the self-interest of disproportionately powerful megacorporations does not benefit everyone. Therefore, governments need to use regulations and other levers to stop them from harming society and the environment, keeping them within the donut. Second, man makes irrational decisions, so policies need to account for that. They can do so by introducing regulation to restrict or de-incentivize damaging behavior, or they can provide nudges, which move people towards more positive behavior. Third, development needs to be redefined to match our 21st century needs. Sustainable growth needs to be regenerative by focusing on reducing, reusing, refurbishing, and recycling the resources in our economies. It also needs to be distributive where resources like land, money, knowledge, and technology are equitably shared among people. If donut economics is the key to solving our 21st century problems, remains to be seen. What it does teach us is that the traditional approach of constant growth based on 19th century assumptions is clearly not working for everyone. Donut economics suggests a more balanced and wider view of economics an approach that tries to include all aspects of the economy and rejects the idea of more is better. The next step for donut economics is for governments, businesses, and communities to adopt the framework and work towards bringing everyone within the safe and just space of the donut.